Welcome to Sober Solutions. We are a weekly recovery podcast, not affiliated with any particular 12-step or recovery program. However, you may hear us mention them. My name is Jason, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Ben. I'm an alcoholic and addict. And welcome back to Sober Solutions Podcast. It is episode 13. Tonight's topic is around powerlessness. Hey, it's good to see you, boys. Uh, how you been? I've had uh, better days. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. What's that about? It's funny when they... Uh... I don't even know who said this, probably no one said this, but maybe that was my conception is that whoever said it's uh, rainbows and butterflies when you're sober is definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, it's my, my nanny quit and my mother staying with us a couple of days, but long story short, I came home early to help her out and put my son to sleep. And when my wife got home, for some reason, and she listed a litany of reasons, she thought I was high. And I literally said to her, I'm like, let's go test me. I don't want to argue about this. I want, and then she's like, well, what is that going to do for me? So I am just sitting here like in awe, which she has some reasons. I'm tired today. I got up at like 530 in the morning. Um, we just went for a run, my daughter and she was riding her scooter. I was running. It's hot out. So I was sweating, you know, she has some, and obviously to be quite honest, a year ago probably would have been true, but you know, I'm at this point where it's like, what do I do and how do I react to this? So I basically just said, I'm tabling this unless you want to test me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. So any suggestions would be, uh, well-received. <laughs> wow. You know, I mean, uh, uh, that that's a hard spot to be in, you know, it, but it just goes back to show where our loved ones are in our recovery. You know, we, we've talked about this on on the show before, and we're going to have an episode uh, soon around the relationship and the family and everything like that, that we'll, we could dive into this more. But they they don't have a program like we do. They don't have this structure of recovery like we do. And they're still trying to heal from all of the damage that we've created in their lives. You know, at the same time, I can't imagine how shitty that has made you feel knowing that you are sober today, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's rough. And what sucks too is, you know, it's in front of my mother. So then she probably, I'm assuming, has these feelings of, oh, well, is he sober? You know, and it just, like you said, it stirs up all these past emotions with both of them. And yeah, I mean, I knew I was talking to you guys tonight. So I basically just said, let's table it. I'm completely open to taking a test, which I hope that, you know, calms, calms her down and hopefully time just heals this one. So. Well, well, you know, the interesting thing about that is that, you know, when you said when she said you, you offered to take a test and, and she responded, well, what would that prove? And, you know, that would prove that you that you weren't using. But, you know, you can see right there where her mind is, because she has a, an idea that you may have been using something. You have a device that will prove that. And she rejected it. And what it really is, it, you know, looking at it, it, it doesn't sound like that maybe she's not worried so much that you did use or it's that as soon as these suspicions came up, that's immediately where her mind went. Right. You know, cause, cause you offered her an, an, an out to say, look, I will prove to you. And she, she didn't want to take it. And I, I think what I've found is that, you know, as I've gone on, I've, I've been able to create safe spaces for, for those around me to be able to feel things and, for me not to take it personally. And it's it's a difficult ask because to be accused of being under the influence when you've been working so hard, it's a tough thing. And it really becomes this, this where we have to, it, the work is never done. You know, the work is never done for me. When I think that I've done enough, I don't say that to myself anymore. I don't go, go, God, I've done this, 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 and this. They shouldn't think that, you know, it's, 
we did mountains and mountains of damage. And so when these things happened and can be completely inconsequential, this wasn't, but you know, it, it really becomes, now it's our responsibility to create a space for them to feel something and say, listen, I understand that you're feeling either angry or scared or nervous or frustrated. I completely understand. And then it's, then we have to be able to let them voice that. And it takes a while. It does. Like, it takes a while to be able to hear somebody's criticisms. And, and I, you know, and I found this when I made my amends to my ex-wife, you know, she at first she was like, I didn't, I don't want it. And then eventually, you know, then she started, you know, kind of, you know, bringing, th bringing a couple of things up. And my sponsor told me, he's like, listen, you have to let them respond pretty much however they want to respond with your wife who you still live with. I mean, that's, it's hard to make an amends because you know it's a it's an ongoing daily process it's a living amends so yeah i mean if you can find a way you know create a space for her to feel things and like you say table it and and then you know it becomes one of those things where if you walk away and you show that look, i'm not angry it's not i'm not taking this personally and then come back and say listen if you're ready to talk whenever you and just leave it there that was my part of thing man like like i had always had to have the last word and to not need to have the last word anymore and genuinely be able to walk away and say, listen, when you're ready, I'll be ready. You know, that is just slowly but surely the thing that one of the things that is that she's eventually going to see you change. And so, brother, it takes time. It takes yeah, time. I wish I had that uh, re initial response. Obviously, I I wasn't as bad as I used to be. You know, back in the day, it would be like World War Three, And I got to that point where I said, let's table this. But at first, I'm like, what are you talking? You know, I uh, obviously get defensiveness. Right. Uh, then I'm like attacking her. Well, how do you think of this? Uh, you know, it's it's you, you, you. And then after a couple minutes, I realized kind of the route I'm going. Stepped back and tried to give more of a safe space and physical space actually right where she can actually feel what she feels and you know i'm just, i'm assuming tomorrow we'll talk about it again but right yeah it'll and take that, time it does and but that's something that like you said you recognize what path you were going down and you stopped yourself and so eventually the next time this happens you may recognize it sooner you may recognize it when she starts accusing you of something and your instinct is to respond back with a you know to defend yourself you may say Ah, wait a second, I know where that's going to take me. And I might get there in five minutes instead of 10 minutes like it took me last time. But eventually, you it's just practice. Unfortunately, it, it it's practice that involves having a an argument with a loved one, which, yeah, yeah sure, practice makes perfect. But God, those are hell. But Well, you know, I think, just... you know, one, one of the things that you said, Ben, was to use empathetic statements. I understand the fear that you have the worry that you have, the anger that you have, because I think that's part of what our loved ones want us to know is mm -hmm. that they want us to know what we've put them through. They and want their feelings validated. Exactly. And, and to Ben's point, and like you were saying, you offered to take this drug test and that's not what this was about. You know, just, just looking at this situation right here and now. And, and I, I think that she, wants to be at a point where she doesn't feel that way, where you can come in the door hot and sweaty and exhausted and looking like you did and not her first thought be, oh, was he high? Right. You know, yeah. I think that's what she's looking for. And she didn't get that. And the natural response was to accuse you of being high. And, you know? and, I, and I'll, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you a, one, one free piece of advice that, that I learned when I, with those empathetic statements where I started to say, I understand, you know, again, you know, it is through therapy. It was through, you know, working with a variety of therapists where I learned those kinds of things. And I, and I would go in with, I understand that you're, you're feeling mad or, fr and what I was hit with was, no, you don't understand what I'm feeling. And because that's a big thing too, is that they might not even understand what they're feeling. So, the idea that, that, you know, it becomes this, how could you possibly know what it was like to be on this side? And so my, my therapist said, listen, no, you got to strip it all the way back. You have to acknowledge just that they're feeling something. And if they understand what it is, 
that's great and you'll be you'll be receptive to it and and you'll want to hear them out and if they don't understand what they're feeling then you're you're still open to you still have that empathy that says okay listen you're feeling something if you if you want some help trying to understand what it might be what got you to that point when did it change you know then you can be that too and it, it really just this the simpler if if you can make it simple it becomes a lot easier but we're addicts, so we don't like to make it simple. <laughs> yeah, and and, it, and I think, you know, saying things like, I understand that you are angry doesn't mean that I understand the anger that you have. And I think this ties in perfectly to tonight's topic around powerlessness. You are powerless over her reaction, over how she's feeling, and you can't do anything to make her feel a different way to make her accept the fact that you are not high in that moment, right? And so I, I think that this topic of powerlessness really is woven into all aspects of our life. You know, a, a perfect example for me is how I work with my sponsees. I want them to be sober and I do everything in my power to walk them through the steps and to show them how to live a sober life the way that I've lived a sober life over the last 325 days. But if they relapse, that's not on me. And it took me a long time as a sponsor to get to that point. You know, I, I had a sponsee, you know, early on who did relapse. Uh, multiple times. And at first, I was really struggling with the fact that he could not get to a point of staying sober more than, you know, a couple days. And, and I really was putting that on myself. And my sponsor and I were talking about it. And he said, you know, you're powerless over, over your sponsor's sobriety. And when he said that, it clicked for me. You know, it's not my job to keep them sober. It's not my job to keep anyone sober but myself, you know, and and I can show people what I've done. I can walk people through the steps, but it's up to them to take the advice, to take the recommendations, to take the suggestions and to do the work, you know. So I really see this as uh, a topic that that really spans across all of our lives and for me, at least, it was the hardest, hardest thing to do was admit that I was powerless over drugs and alcohol. Because for me, I have not so much of an ego as I did. It's still there and I still have to constantly surrender. But my ego would not let me say I am powerless over drugs and alcohol. And I think that's what kept me out over and over and over for the last 10 years. You know, two things. One, for you to say that you don't have an ego is impressive because, you know, the listeners can't see, but Jason is is tan. He's got he's got the, you know, the the white beater on. He looks looking fit, looking like a, an absolute stud out here. And and so if you can get some pressure, you go through that. I, I, I applaud you. Um, <laughs> I'll but, pay, I'll pay you, know, you after the episode, Ben. <laughs> I appreciate that. Venmo's open. Venmo's open. Um, you know, it, this this kind of brings me to what uh, our guest a couple of weeks ago, Matt, was talking about. You know, and everybody's recovery is different, and I think one of the things that you know, we, you know, we might struggle with, or at least I might struggle with, as a as a sponsor of a particular program is that that is just for me, those around me, you guys, loved ones, doesn't matter. Everybody's recovery looks different. And so I can't allow myself to, you know, get caught up in, are they doing it this way? Or are they doing it that way? Cause I'm powerless over it. I can't, there's nothing I can do to make them recover the way I recovered. And so, yeah, it, it really becomes a, 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 a true examination of how I'm reacting. And it's the same thing, like Jason said, like, you are not in control at this moment. 
I think that's probably the only thing I would, you, you know, kind of just, just, just to circle back, as they say in some emails, you know, the, when you said there's nothing that Chris can do to change his wife's response today, he can't, he can't do anything because the response already happened, but he, you know, it, it's also, you're, you're the only one that can actually change how she responds in the future. And maybe the next time she re still responds the same way, maybe the time after that, maybe the next 25 times, but eventually it's this, I don't want to say war of attrition, but it becomes this, you know, exercise in just patience that, that, you know, when, you know, to, to, to be married is to be together forever. In most cases, not all. I'm an example of that. Jason too. So Ben, I, I actually kind of agree and kind of don't agree. You know, I, I think you have the right track where, you know, what he does in today. Um, but I think that the only way that we can change someone's thought about us is to keep doing the, what we're doing every yeah. single day. And yeah. even, even if we stay sober and Chris, you stay sober for a hundred years, that will never, uh, or that will only be what it is. You staying sober, right. your wife, your mother, us will always have our own opinions and we can't change other people's opinions. It'll be their opinions but we can only do what we're doing for ourselves, regardless of what other people think. And I think that's what you were talking about. Yeah, it's, it's just funny because I was actually going to say I respectfully disagree on one end, too. And, you know, the list of things that we can't control is just exponentially long. I mean, we can't control what happens down the street, the car next. To, I mean, it's just everything. But the list of things that we can control, which are your attitudes and actions, that's it, right? Your mm -hmm. your actions and your attitudes. And what I do today, I still can't change what, what my wife thinks or does. I can do what I do, and hopefully she has a mindset where she changed. And I, we're all saying the same thing. We're just saying yeah. it in different ways. Yes, my actions might influence her reaction, but I am still not in control of what she does or doesn't do. And right. and the only thing that you are in control of is the way that you react. Right. 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 Yeah, and you, you kind you, of said that before. Right. Yeah. You know what? No, my, my take was wrong. It's, it's really what it is. I, I, because it's, do we have this really, on record? Are we recording right now? Absolutely. I think absolutely. we are. No, just <laughs> this is an on-air 10 step. You know, the, the, you know, it, no, it, it, no, because my first thought was like, you know, if you want her to change, then it's going to, you're going to have to, you know, you'll, your, your, your actions will be responsible for that change. But that's just not the case because yeah, you could, you can change and be sober and be the best, you know, you could be the best man that you ever could want to be. And that just might not, you know, ring her yeah. bell anymore. It right. just, right. It, she, it might just not be enough and, and that's okay. You know? And, and, you know, it's funny because when you both disagreed, I was like, wait a second, what am I missing? And uh, yeah, stupid me. I, I'm missing, you know, my own personal experience of, I could have changed a, for a billion years me, me and my ex-wife were, we had run our course and, and now we're, our relationship is probably better than it's ever been because we're, we're not trying to hold this, hold a marriage together that wasn't, wasn't working because we weren't working for it. And I, yeah, I could have changed, I could have spent decades trying to change and, you know, I, and I, and so, yeah, you know what? So don't listen to, you know, five minutes ago, just keep doing you. Just no, keep no. Doing you. I, 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 listen, I, I get, I get that you're trying to backpedal and, and you're trying to look good right now, but that was, that was <laughs> your authentic reaction to it. And I, I there's nothing wrong with it. You right. know, no, so, it was my authentic reaction until I was, it, I was presented with, wait a second. Mm. And I think that's a big part of it. You know what? I think that's a big part of this program to be able when somebody brings something up and go, no, 
and I mean the program of recovery, just becoming a, an open-minded person that, you know, can hear something and go, wait a second, actually what they said makes more sense. And, and in fact, if I took it a little bit, instead of, I should have looked into myself first and I would have, my experience right there was the perfect example of why, you know, it, and again, and it really, it was, I was speaking a principle of changing for somebody else and you can't do that. That's just something you That's cannot That's a good point. Do. I, I think we should, I love the topic of powerlessness and I love the direction we're going, but maybe we can uh, discuss the literal aspect of what people probably think directly when they think of powerlessness. So we're all, all here for alcohol or drugs. And, you know, first of all, to circle back with ego, I used to think that powerlessness was a weakness. And that's just not the case. It's really just lack of control. And for me, when I put one opiate in me, it I, it's impossible for me, you know what, that one time I might do one, but I'm thinking about it and thinking about it. And it's ruminating in my head. And within a month, I will be doing 50. And I will be taking out loans or stealing money somehow. And the same thing goes with alcohol. It's never just one. And if it is one, it just consumes your mind. So I guess what's your take on the more literal sense of powerlessness in your addiction? I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, so I, if you can't tell, I'm, I'm fighting a, a chest cold infection or whatever my doctor called it. And <laughs> Uh, she just she prescribed me uh, albuterol inhaler to help my the congestion, and my initial my initial response to this was her her direction was take two puffs every four hours or as needed right and I was like as needed I can take as many as I want. And it's an albuterol inhaler. It's not going to get me high. It's not going to get me messed up. You know, it's to help clear the congestion. But I just want to be puffing on that albuterol inhaler the entire day because that's how my addict mind thinks. Now, am I doing that? No, I'm, I'm doing my best to stay, you know, with her direction. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you, Chris. I, I actually had the thought, I think it was earlier this week or, or last week where I was like, gosh, you know, I have a couple extra pounds on me. I really want to get rid of it fast. Maybe I'll smoke some crystal meth because that always got rid of my weight really fast. And I was like, I could just smoke for maybe three days and then I'll stop. But that is just ridiculous because every single time I do drugs or drink alcohol, it's not just once. Right. Maybe maybe a drink here, like you said, maybe a drink there, but within two weeks, and, and I've looked back on this, it's always within two weeks, I'm back to drinking a bottle of vodka or up for five days, you know, inevitably. And I, I also agree with your point that I saw powerlessness as weakness. And, and I was talking about this earlier, where that is what kept me from surrendering to this disease. I didn't want to seem weak. I, I grew up as weakness is something that's quote unquote bad, right? And powerlessness is weakness. So therefore powerlessness is bad. And it wasn't until I was sitting in my apartment, completely defeated after this, uh, intervention that I literally had to throw up my hands in the air and say, I surrender. And in that moment is when I was able to start my journey to recovery. And I remember in rehab, I was still fighting with this concept of, of being powerless over something. And, and it's not the fact that I don't have control over being able to do it or not until it's in my system. Once it's in my system, then I'm powerless over it. But I have maintained control 
overdoing the things that I need to do so that I don't put that first one in me. And it's, it's from that time that I put that first one in me that then I become powerless over it. Yeah. That, that powerlessness was a couple of weeks ago. Um, when I was driving through New Brunswick and I was going to come home to an empty apartment and there's, you know, liquor stores and bars everywhere. And my first thought was nobody would know. I was totally powerless over that. I had no control over that being my first thought, you know, and, and that when I was at my parents a, a couple of weeks ago, they're in the middle of, of doing some home renovations. So they, they took this big uh, set of cabinets, then moved it downstairs into the basement. And that was the liquor cabinet. It was the liquor cabinet that I frequented and and instead of putting the liquor back in the cabinet, when it got to the basement, my dad just left it all on the counter down there. And so I went down there the other day to get something out of the printer and there was just booze everywhere, everywhere. And I just thought, well, people would know here. But my first thought was if I, I'm, you know, I'm in the basement, like I, no one's going to know. But the problem is, is that I'm far enough away from what it was like to try to hide that. So yeah, I could take a sip of something today, but then I'm also going to have to do work to cover it up because I spent so much time covering up. I still know how to cover up the, you know, drinking, you know, uh, you know, a couple of cups of coffee and it's off your breath. Like, and, and, and so that's the thing that will get me to the second and third one is not just the first drink, but covering up the first drink. And now all of a sudden I'm back into manipulation and deception. And that's the stuff I don't want to go back to. The drinking, you know, we all had good times drinking or doing drugs, but but we had horrendous times, the horrendous things that, that they brought us. And, and we get, I get complacent sometimes and forget those bad times. And so it's when, when I have that first thought, I have to force myself to sit down and go, wait a second. Don't be an idiot. Don't forget how bad it was because it literally cost you your marriage. It cost you your relationship with your, your daughters as you once knew it, your home. It cost me my entire life. And yet 10 months, I'm, I'm only 10 months removed. And I've, and I'll sometimes forget that what it cost me. It, it's interesting, Ben, when you were just saying that, which, you know, I think was a great explanation um, as even Matrix commented here, um, what came to my mind was we're power, powerless over the first thought, but we do have power over our first action right after that first thought, right? So if we have that first thought, I want to go drink, I want to go do crystal meth, I want to take a pill, that we don't have any power over because we're alcoholics and addicts. However, we do have that first uh, power over the first action of what we do with it. I can call my sponsor. I can go to a meeting. I can call uh, another friend in recovery. I can check in with one of you guys. I can, you know, check in with my gratitude list. I can do whatever I need to do. Go take a shower, go for a run, go to the gym. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, something in some kind of program. It could be anything to get us out of our head so that we that first thought doesn't become a second thought and a third thought and a, and a, an obsession, you know? When I think about that, um, I think about Ben driving home from the hospital and his first thought was to go to the liquor store and then how he, you know, had control or at that time had control over his second thought and third thought. And, you know, when I think of powerlessness as a whole, it's pretty freeing because, mm -hmm. When you finally get to a point where you realize you can't control, like take recovery out of it, just anything in life other than what you're doing, you don't try to control those things. And it's very draining and tiring to try to control everything, right? It really you know, is. Yeah. I mean, powerlessness is just about uh, accepting what is in, in life, right? I think that's an excellent, excellent yeah. way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the mental and emotional capital we spend, or I, or I spent trying to control others was just, it was literally exhausting. And to be free of that now 
it's it's a it's a just a beautiful thing you know because some of the things that i do have power over you know and, and i would, would love to you know get your thoughts on this um and jason you started rattling a few of them off what what is in your control when you do have that first thought you know the other thing i have control over is, is my daily routine i have power over what i am going to do every single day and like you take recovery out of it i'm gonna you know I'm going to make my bed. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z chores. I'm going to make a to-do list of things that I'm going to tackle. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to cross them off that list. Like those are the things that I have power over and I enjoy sitting in that. That's a much better feeling to sit in that. And it, it, again, it's just small accomplishments and I, I, need, I don't need a ticker tape parade, but it's just so much easier to just take care of the things that I can take care of and do them to the best of my ability. And I have to let everybody else handle what they're going to handle. And, and I just, I can't, I, I just don't, it's just too exhausting to try to, to try to, that's all it is. It's too exhausting. It is. And, you know, to your point and, and Chris's point earlier, this does span across the continuum of our life. So I, I was just thinking about how there have been in, in previous organizations, um, and, and I'm new to my new job, so I don't know if it's like this now just yet, but people within the organization that have a different personality, have a different style of working, have a different way of communicating, different than mine, right? And so, that kind of rattles me a little bit and, and I want to get angry and I want to get frustrated, but I can't control the way that they are. I can control the way that I react and in full transparency, I have not reacted in the best ways. You know, um, I, I have learned to hold emails for at least uh, 12 hours <laughs> before sending, but I, I can't control the way that they are. And that goes across anyone in my life. You know, I can't control the three of you. You know, I can only control myself. And one of the things that I've been really struggling with recently is my own self care and, and in regards to how stressful my life has really gotten um, with, you know, working, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, adding on school on top of that, adding on, you know, the hours we spend here recording, the hours that I go to meetings or I'm chairing meetings or running business meetings. And I felt as though I was starting to skid. You know, the, the image that popped into mind was a car driving down a slippery road and it's starting to fishtail a little bit. And, and my conversation with my sponsor today, as I was driving back down to the beach here, was to take control, just like you were talking about, Ben. I ha That's what I do have power over. You know, I don't have to work on weekends. I can shut off at a certain time at night. I can watch the great British baking show for two hours, you know, which is my new obsession. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's actually pretty fantastic. <laughs> I, I love the British accent. What a plug. And yeah. <laughs> they are, by the way, they are not a sponsor of this show. Just, yeah. just <laughs> saying that. Um, but I, I have the ability to unplug. And that's what I do have power over. And, and that's something, you know, to your question, Ben, what I do is I just unplug. I, I, took a shower when I got here. I watched an episode of the, the show and I just unwound myself a little bit instead of, you know, having to do laundry and, and doing all these other things that I have to do around the house. I just let go for a little bit and, and just relaxed. It's funny, Jason, you've actually had some sort of, you've said that statement a few times over the last week about, how your life's starting to be really busy and yeah. I don't want to say unmanageable, but busy and you know, how you are trying to unplug from work, uh, prioritize self care. 
And one thing I hope everyone that does listen realizes is I personally, I'll say this for me, I'm not trying to preach because I am absolutely not perfect. And I don't sit here and say, oh, I don't try to control people because I still find (laughs) myself doing that. You know, I don't do this. I don't do that. It's that I'm at least now I'm cognizant of the fact that I am doing or not doing and I try to get better. And Mm -hmm. I just, I just want all the listeners to realize that is I, you know, I'll speak for me, but I'm sure, you know, Jason and Ben emulate the same thoughts is we are not perfect and we're just trying to get better than yesterday. Oh yeah. No. One of the things that I, that, that I, I don't want to say pride myself on, but that I, I won't apologize for is that I have the right to make mistakes. I'm an infallible human being. I have a responsibility, however, to learn from them. And that's just, you know, who I'm trying to be today. A person that it's okay not to, not to, it's not the end of the world if I mess up. It doesn't matter in what aspect of life, at work, with my ex-wife, with my girlfriend, with my daughters, my parents, my siblings, my friends, I'm going to misstep guaranteed. The question is going to be how many times and how often. But the the thing that helps me is I check my motives. And you know what, Jason, if you want to watch the Great British Baking Show, then you go ahead and do it. Because you know what, if if you were watching the Great British Baking Show and neglecting the things that you had to do, okay, sure. I I, I can see why that, that might, you know, be a cause for concern. But yeah, no, we as human beings deserve to relax a little bit. When, and as addicts, we're way too hard on ourselves sometimes. I know I am. And it's just, and so I won't apologize for, for playing Xbox. I won't because you know what? I, I, and I, I just, it's just fun and it's not drinking and I'm not neglecting anything else. Everything else is still getting done. And it just takes my mind off of, any kind of menial stuff that that might be floating around and guess what it, it works today well, there you go there you go i think that's a great uh spot to end for tonight boys um really great to uh hear your thoughts on this chris thank you for uh sharing your story and, and allowing us to to add some input on it. And as always, tonight's episode is dedicated to the still sick and suffering alcoholic and addict, especially the individual who's going to pick up for the first time tonight. Have a great night, guys. Have a good night. Have a great night. We appreciate your liking and subscribing to our podcast. If you liked what you heard today and would like to support our podcast, feel free to Venmo a dollar to our virtual basket at Sober Solutions Podcast. We want to hear from you too. If you have a comment, question, topic, or would like to come on the show, find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Sober Solutions Podcast. Or you can shoot us an email to Sober Solutions Podcast at gmail.com. Find us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show.